By now you should be familiar with uh, the first two of Kepler's three laws. The first law is the law of elliptical orbits. Second law is the law of equal areas. We know that's consistent with the law of conservation of angular momentum. So here I want to focus on the third law, often referred to as the law of harmony. So let's add a little more detail to what we know about the motion of the planets um, in their elliptical paths. I'm drawing the planet at perihelion, I call its mass lowercase m, and the sun, or our star uh, named Sol, is sitting at one of the two foci, or at a focus of the ellipse. So the distance between the planet and the sun at perihelion is r1, and the distance between the planet and the sun at aphelion is r2. This whole distance all the way across the widest part of the ellipse is the major axis. If we divide that in half, then we get a distance known as the semi-major axis. And we uh, give a name to that or a symbol for it. We'll replace the length of the semi-major axis with lowercase a. And so it should be clear that 2 times a is the length of the major axis, but 2 times a should also be the same thing as the distance at perihelion plus the distance at aphelion. Okay, so here I have that diagrammed a little better. 2a equals r1 plus r2, or in other words, the semi-major axis is um, just the average of the distance at perihelion plus the distance at aphelion. So we've stated uh, in a previous lecture, for a circular orbit, if a satellite orbits an attractor in a perfectly circular path, then the force of gravity is the centripetal force acting on the object. The mass of the satellite cancels out. Uh, the equation simplifies a bit. And we have V is the square root of gm over r. That should look familiar. But we can also replace V with 2 pi r over t. And from all this, if we put it together, as you've seen, we get an equation that says the period is 2 pi times the square root of r cubed over gm. Or if you prefer, we can express it as period squared equals 4 pi squared over gm times r cubed. Now all of this is a constant. So we could say that the ratio of period squared over radius cubed is a constant value, meaning if I compare any one satellite to another, if they both orbit the same attractor, capital M, then any two satellites should have a ratio of period squared to orbital radius cubed. Um, and that ratio represents the same value. Two satellites, satellite number one orbiting in a circular path, and satellite number two orbiting in a circular path. If they both orbit the same attractor M, then this ratio of the time it takes to complete one orbit compared to the radius of their orbit, the period squared over radius cubed is a constant value. That represents the law of harmony, but with one problem. All of these assumptions, or all of these uh, expressions, have been made on the assumption uh, for circular orbits. Well, uh, to cut to the chase, if we want to put this in simpler terms, uh, this same law applies in the case of an ellipse, and all we have to do is substitute away the r and replace it with a, the length of the semi-major axis. So for any two planets orbiting the sun, there's the sun, 
there is one planet in a exaggerated elliptical orbit and there's another planet in an exaggerated elliptical orbit then we can take the length of the semi-major axis for planet number one and the length of the semi-major axis for planet number two and make this statement about the law of harmony the time it takes for planet number one to complete one orbit squared compared to the length of the semi-major axis of its elliptical path cubed is the exact same ratio of period squared to semi-major axis cubed for the second planet. That's the law of harmony. Now I want to give you a um, well, a way to uh, figure out what the length of year for any planet is. See, we could rearrange this. Um, since we're taking comparative ratios, time doesn't have to be in seconds, and orbital radius doesn't have to be in meters. We could use any units we want. In fact, the time could be in years, and the radius could be in astronomical units. Remember what an astronomical unit is. By definition, an astronomical unit is the distance uh, from the Earth to the sun. Again, figure not drawn to scale, right? Oh, by the way, uh, there's something interesting about the number 108 when it comes to the Earth and the sun. So, uh, if you want to know how big the sun is in diameter, if you take 108 Earths and put them end to end, that's a pretty good idea how you can relate to the diameter of the sun. Then we can ask the question, how many suns can I put end to end in the distance between the Earth and the sun? Turns out that number is also 108. So in other words, the distance from the Earth to the sun should be 108 squared uh, times the diameter of the Earth. 108 squared times the, di well, the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. So the diameter would be twice that. So, hey, grab your calculator, see what you get. 108 squared multiplied by 2 multiplied by 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. That comes out to 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. And that's what we mean by an AU, an astronomical unit. Okay, now why is it convenient to express period in years and um, distance in astronomical units? Well then, it's very simple. If I, wanna, if I want my second planet to be anything other than the Earth, and by comparison, let planet one be the Earth, well then this ratio is very easy. The Length of time is one year for the Earth. Well, one squared is one. And the distance for the semi-major axis for the Earth's orbit around the Sun is one AU. And one cubed is one. So, now we just have an expression that says one is equal to the number of years for any other planet squared divided by the length of its semi-major axis cubed. So in other words, uh, period is equal to the square root of orbital radius cubed. In other words, the period in years would correspond to the length of the semi-major axis in AUs uh, according to this formula. That's the key formula. A little messy, I know I'm writing all over the place, but uh, if you're taking notes on this lecture, you definitely want to copy down that expression. So here's the real question. Is there an easy way to memorize what the distance is in AUs for all the planets? Well, it turns out there is. It's based on something known as the Bode-Titus Law, or often just referred to as Bode's Rule. So here's a picture of Johann Bode. Somewhere in the 1700s, he popularized this rule, and um, this is actually an excerpt taken from um, 
the pages of one of his manuscripts. And it has something to do with, at that point in time, the six known plants. Interesting, huh? Six plants. So, well, uh, you might think of it as eight known planets. If you want to include Pluto, then you can say nine planets. Um, but Pluto really is a dwarf planet, along with Ceres and Makemake and Aumea and so on. Anyhow, you can see without reading in any detail that there's some sort of um, mathematical progression that describes the spacing of the planets. And in particular, there's mention of a gap in this order. Somewhere after Mars... Um, and before Jupiter, there should be some planet that has not yet been seen. Now, this refers to a planet, well, a dwarf planet, that was discovered in the year 1801. Remember that one? By Giuseppe Piazzi? Yeah. Giuseppe Piazzi in the year 1801 discovered Ceres, the largest body in the asteroid belt, which is one of our solar system's dwarf planets. In any case, here's uh, Bodhi's rule, and uh, there's no physical explanation for it. So uh, it's just a numerical sequence that has no rationale behind it. And I want you to see if you can figure out the pattern of this sequence. Start with 0, 3, 6, 12. Can you figure out how the sequence goes? Keep going until you've accounted for a total of uh, nine numbers in the sequence. Yeah, right, we just keep on doubling. 24, 48, 96, 192, and 384. And just for the heck of it, let's add 4 to every one of these and see what we get. 4, 7, 10, 16, 28, 52, 100, 196, and 388. And while we're at it, let's divide every one of these numbers by 10. So 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 1.0, 1.6, 2.8, 5.2, 10.0, 19.6, and 38.8. Now what's special about these numbers? These represent very nearly, not exactly, the distance between the average distance between the sun and uh, several of our planets. Now again, the reason we have to say average distance is because the planets move in elliptical orbits. So if the sun is at one of the two foci, there's a shorter distance and a longer distance. And again, keep in mind, I keep reminding you, this is a very exaggerated drawing. If you really want to know what it looks like, it's more like this. It appears that the planets are orbiting in circular paths and that the sun is very nearly at the center. And so you can't see in this diagram that there's really a difference between R1 in R2, they probably look the same. I don't know, if we were to zoom in and measure carefully, we might see a subtle difference between the two. And that's probably a better diagram of the motion of the planets, but we like to exaggerate that so there's a uh, clear visual that there's a difference between R1 and R2. So the average of those two would be the length of the semi-major axis. So the Earth sometimes is closer to the Sun, sometimes farther away, and uh, well, if you haven't learned this before, you might guess that this is summertime, right? It's hotter in the summer, so that must be when the Earth is closer, but truth is the Earth orbits on a tilted axis, so if this dashed line represents the equator, we have the North Pole and the South Pole, this is actually our winter time because the Northern Hemisphere is not receiving the direct rays of sunlight. The direct rays of sunlight would be shining on the Southern Hemisphere. The Earth maintains that same tilt um, by the way, that tilt is about 23 and a half degrees. So when the Earth is farthest away in summertime, around the end of June, that's when the rays of sun are most directly incident on the northern hemisphere. So in any case, it's not that large of a distance. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, maybe... It's something like 0 0.98 AU in the middle of winter and 1.02 AU in the middle of summer. I encourage you to look that up and see how dramatic the difference is for planet Earth for the distances at perihelion and aphelion. In any case, 
the distance between the Sun and Mercury, on average, is about 0.4 astronomical units. And Venus is about 0.7. By definition, the Earth is, on average, a distance of one astronomical unit away. Mars is 1.6, and as uh, Bodhi noticed, there's a gap in the order. So in his time, nothing was known at a distance of 2.8. Then Jupiter, my very eager mother, just served us nachos. Actually, the object that orbits around the sun at a distance of 38.8 AAU is Pluto. So there's nothing in this pattern to account for Neptune. And in the year 1801, well after Bodhi had popularized this rule, uh, Giuseppe Piazzi discovered Ceres in the asteroid belt. And where was it? Yeah, at a distance of 2.8 astronomical units. So are there other planets that lie beyond the orbit of uh, Pluto uh, that fit into this pattern? Well, there definitely are other dwarf planets, and I've never uh, checked to see if the distance of their semi-major axis fits into Bode's rule. Um, there's no reason that they should, because this is not founded in any uh, physical explanation. But in any case, it gives us a clever way to remember uh, or recall the distances to the planets. So, here's a good example. How long is a Saturn year? If Saturn orbits ten times as far away from the Sun as the Earth does, is its year ten times as long as ours? No. The ratio of period squared to average orbital radius cubed is a constant. So in years, the, um, a year on Saturn can be found by taking the square root of the orbital radius in astronomical units cubed. So this means we just have to take the square root of 10 cubed, which is the square root of 1,000. And the square root of 1,000 is about 31.6 years. So I'd say if you live a good life, um, you should see your way nearly to three orbits of Saturn, right? In your first orbit of Saturn, you finish your education, start your career, and maybe begin to form a family. By the end of your second orbit of Saturn, you should probably think about retiring from your career and planning for your golden years. And uh, as long as you stay healthy, hopefully you can enjoy your third orbit of Saturn. So without going through the calculations, I'll leave it up to you to see, will you live for a full orbit of Uranus? Will you live for a full orbit of Pluto? Um, you can easily figure this out based on the law of harmony and um, Bodhi's rule.